Welcome back to Red Barn Acres. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Stephen Smith. At the request of one of my viewers, I'm doing a follow-up video. The purpose of this video is to show the internal parts and some of the construction techniques used in making the Derringer. I'll try to answer the who, why, when, where, and how of the Derringer build. Why? I decided to build this little pistol to prove a point that no gun control laws will stop someone from obtaining a firearm. While this firearm is currently legal to build in the United States and Tennessee where I live, at some point and in some jurisdictions it is not legal. Please consult your local laws before attempting anything like this. However, the point is to prove that one can be obtained regardless of the legality. Who? I built this pistol alone, by myself. No one else's expertise was needed or asked for. The skills I didn't have, such as how to nickel plate metal, I easily found on YouTube. When? I built this pistol over a period of about a month in 2019. I would work a few hours here and there until I finally got it finished. If I had really been in a rush, I could have had a working firearm in about two to three days time. Where? I built it in my little workshop in my backyard. I have a lot of tools, but no CNC, plasma, bandsaw, or any other advanced metalworking tools. I nickel plated the metal in my kitchen because I needed a cleaner workspace for that task. How? I'll explain more about that throughout the video, but I basically found a PDF online with a basic Derringer frame outline. You can do a quick Google search to find a diagram to use as a starting point. I printed that out and used it as a rough guide for fashioning the parts by hand. I used saws, grinders, files, a dremel, and some sandpaper. I have a drill press that helped me make some good screw holes, but some were done with a simple hand drill. I used a tap and die set to thread the holes for the screws, but it's not something difficult to do for a job like this. What you're seeing now are parts from an old Western Field 22 rifle. I purchased this non-functioning rifle from a local gun shop for $13. Yes, I still had to go through a background check and show ID to purchase it. I bought this old rifle so I'd have a donor barrel for the Derringer. I chose to do this to comply with current firearm laws that require pistols to have rifled barrels. In an expedient illegal build, you could just as easily have drilled out a piece of mild steel and chose not to add riflings. I completely disassembled this rifle, removed the stock and barrel from the receiver before cutting down the barrel to be used for the pistol. I may use the remainder of the barrel for a future project. I just need to drill out a new chamber. I also used a small piece of the stock to make the grips. The rest of the pistol was made from scrap metal and tubing I just had laying around in the scrap pile. I did purchase springs, screws, and some pure nickel metal on Amazon for plating the finished project. I'll now go into the disassembly process and show you the internals. Before I disassemble anything, I'm going to check to make sure it's not loaded and it's safe. Nothing in the chamber. We can begin. I'll start by removing the barrel catch. It's a single nut. It's handmade. It has a spring and the catch itself was made from a single piece of sheet metal. It has a little hook on this end to catch the barrel. Outside is smooth and nickel plated, and this piece is threaded. Next thing I'll do is take off the barrel, it's a single screw here. did have some Loctite on this, so it's a little bit tight. The 
barrels removed. There's another screw here that is used to basically space the receiver. You can see that. I'll leave that screw in. The next piece we'll remove is the hammer detent and spring. Simply push it in to go behind the hammer and then pull it out with your fingers. Detent and spring. Now the hammer falls back with no spring tension. I'm going to go ahead and remove the hammer now. Threaded both halves of the receiver because the metal is so thin it helps to have more threads. And I'll remove the hammer slowly. A little dirt and grease in there. Now the trigger comes forward you can see the spring behind the trigger. Now I'll unscrew the trigger. I'll use a bit smaller screwdriver for this one. slide the trigger out. It's got a sharp edge for engaging the hammer. When it's fully cocked, it's here. When you push the trigger, it disengages the hammer and the hammer falls. Very simple. As with any 22, as you start disassembling this, the gunpowder residue starts to appear. So it's actually kind of dirty up in here from the 22 powder. The next thing we're going to do is to take the grips off. I'll use a smaller screwdriver. This screw is inset into the wood. On the head side. So you can see there's two holes in the grip. One for the screw and one for a pin to hold it in place. Here's the pin. Here 
Here's the other grip. Fits tight on the pin. Keeps the grip panels from moving. As you can see, I drilled a hole in this side and inserted uh, another handmade nut into this to hold the other half of the grip panel in place. Now I'll take a digital caliper and give you some basic measurements of these parts. I'll get this in millimeters. First, the thickness of the receiver parts, including the nickel plating, is 2.47 millimeters. 2.50 millimeters. So there can be some variation since these parts were handmade and hand sanded. The internal between these two is 6.45 millimeters. I think this part itself here. It's about 5.8 might as well call it six. This pin, 4.8 millimeter pin, this metal here on the side, 1.28 millimeters or 1.3. The length from here to here, 15.67. thirty one point four eight the overall length of the receiver ninety point seven millimeters these internal parts like the trigger six millimeters it's going to be basically the same metal that you use for this part of the receiver except sand it down a little bit so it wiggles. Overall length of the trigger piece is 25.5 millimeters. The hammer, made of the same metal, 6.12. There's some variation from one end to the other, 6.08 the length, overall length of the hammer piece is 29.73. Where the firing pan goes through the receiver wall is 2.6 millimeters. These little holes are relevant, but they're about three millimeters, three and a half millimeters. That's, the holes are all going to vary based on what type of screws you use. This is the firing pin screw, 3.4 millimeters, 14.8. It's going to have roughly the same length as the other screws, 14.8. This one's a thicker screw at 4.78. The hammer detent, again, same metal as these parts. 4.98, I sanded this down a little bit more. This is all out of a flat piece of metal, and I chalked it up in the drill press and used a file to make this round. The barrel. sixty four point nine millimeters and for the people that like English measurements 
that's basically two and a half inches, 2.55. This, again, same metal as this, 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 and this. It's going to be cut out of 6 millimeter thick steel. That would be quarter inch. It's 0.239 after it's sanded down a little bit. So it's quarter inch steel. So if you want to use quarter inch for this, 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 and this, that's fine. This piece in inches is a uh, one tenth of an inch. The grip panel thickness is 0.3 inches, 0.33, so a third of an inch, or 8.4 millimeters. I can guarantee that this one's not going to be the same thickness because these were all handmade, so it's 8.57. This piece of metal here that holds the barrel, the barrel catch, same metal. It's just hand shaped, probably a little thinner, 5.75 millimeters. This is a piece of wood from the stock of the rifle. It's the same wood that was used for this. Here's the barrel. This was attached, I guess, something like this. I cut it down some. Actually, there was probably an inch I cut off after making it. But as you can see, I put this in the drill press and used the sander to get it roughly the right shape. So it was bigger. Now I'll see how fast I can reassemble this pistol. There's a hole drilled in the back of the trigger for the spring. Insert it in. Let it fit tight. And it presses against this part of the receiver. Next piece is going to be the hammer. clean these things later. The detent for the hammer and the hammer spring slides right in here and then just pushes right in behind the hammer. It stays put here. So now when I cock it back, the trigger moves forward and locks in place. Let's put the grips back on.
Now the tip of this screwdriver is too wide to go much further. Switch screwdrivers and go with a small one. As you can see, there's some gaps, some problems with the metal working, but it's my pistol. It's not for sale, so I don't care. Grips are on solid now. Next piece we'll put on is the barrel. Next piece, the barrel catch. Put that in place. The spring. And the barrel catch nut. That's it. Fully assembled. One thing I'll mention now that I've got it reassembled is that the screws are called gun screws, G-U-N screws. I bought them at Ace Hardware. They're not expensive, but they're in gunmetal black. They've been blued. And they have flat, nice heads for use in guns. So you can get these at Ace Hardware or online. The springs I picked up at a local auto parts store similar to Napa Auto Parts. Don't expect to get good parts at AutoZone or any places like that. Go to a industrial parts store to try to find those. I'm going to go through the nickel plating process to show you how it was done. As you can see, it's a little rough. It's not perfect. The metal is still pitted in places. The nickel coating is not the best quality. But I did it at home, didn't pay somebody, and this should last a long time. Now, why did I choose plating? I just wanted something cool looking. I could have painted this, or blued it, or parkerized it, or any other coating, but I thought that an old Derringer probably would look cool nickel plated. How do I get the nickel plating on the pistol? Well, you use nickel plating electrolyte. How do you get nickel plating electrolyte? You make it. First you need a jar of some kind. It can be any size. You need some vinegar. How much vinegar? Depends on the size of your jar. Just fill it up to around the bottom of the rim. Then add salt. Add a couple tablespoons of salt stir it in that should finish up the first portion how do you get it to be green and why do you need it to be green we know that vinegar and salt together is still clear you're going to need nickel metal this is pure nickel metal from US solid I bought this on Amazon these are nickel metal anodes, just basically little strips of nickel metal. Little thin strips. If you can find thicker ones, I recommend it. If you can find old nickels currency, use those. Doesn't matter, just needs the nickel metal. What else are you going to need? 
going to need some little pieces of copper wire. You can get that by stripping an extension cord or some old appliance. You're going to need a cell phone charger. This one puts out 5 volts. You're going to need 5 or 6 volts on your output. 1 amp. You'll need some alligator clips. One for positive, one for negative. I labeled mine. This goes to the part. And this goes to the anode. Another thing I used is a bamboo skewer. This is simply to hang the part from. The copper wire is basically to hang the parts and to conduct electricity. Now to set up a part for electroplating, first of all you need the part. This is just a piece of spring for demonstration purposes. You need this clean and degreased or the electroplating will not work properly. What I do is take the part, attach the copper wire in an inconspicuous place. For an internal part like a spring you really don't have to be careful but if you're going to coat like a barrel or a receiver you don't want the copper wire touching any place that's going to be visible so run it through a screw hole or something like that and hang it by that. The next thing you do is to get your jar it should have the clear liquid in it at this point the red wire on mine is the positive the black wire is the negative I'll show you how to identify that you attach the ground wire or negative to the part what I did with mine is wrap the bamboo and then just let the part hang. Try to position it in the toward the center of the jar. The next thing you want to do is to take some of your nickel metal, several pieces if you've got the smaller ones like I do, attach your positive and hang that in the jar as well. I tend to hang this over to the side away from the part. And one thing you can do little trick is to just clip this metal to the side of the jar like that. Let it hang into the vinegar solution. Put your part back in and now plug in the cell phone charger into the wall socket. When you do this, you're going to see one of the parts start to bubble. The part that starts to bubble is the negative. You always make your part that you're wanting to coat the negative. As the nickel starts to dissolve in the solution, the vinegar will turn green. The liquid will turn green when it has fully absorbed nickel. You can reuse this, so just put a jar lid on it put it in a drawer somewhere or a cabinet take it out and you can use it later now I've got a part set up in the electrolyte solution as you can see the ground is attached to the part that's going to be plated the positive is attached to the anode that's made of nickel the part will start bubbling when I plug this in As you can see, there's a lot of bubbles coming off the part now. Now, how long does this take? It varies depending on the size of the part and if you need to replace the anode. These thin anodes, as you can see here, dissolve during the process. So if the part completely dissolves, you have to stop, replace it with a new one, and keep going. That's why I use a couple at a time, typically. Most of the parts on this pistol took anywhere from an hour to two hours of nickel plating time to have a finished part. It goes from a dull steel to a shiny nickel finish. The nickel does not need polishing when you're done, washing it in the sink and drying it with a paper towel and buffing it just a tad. Then you have a really shiny protected part. Now that I've shown you the basic process of nickel plating, if you want more details, there's several other good videos on YouTube. Just go do a search and you should be able to find it. That's how I did it. I can reuse this later. 
just put a lid on it, put it in the cabinet. Take all your little parts like your cell phone charger and your nickel metal and wires and alligator clips and whatever, label it, store it together with this. So you have it for next time. I've got a lot of different cans of sealers, polyurethanes, stains. You can basically just go to any hardware store, Home Depot, Lowe's, Ace, and pick out the type of stain you would like. Uh, you may not even want to go with a polyurethane. You might want to go with a butcher block sealer. And then put the right coating and color that you want on these grips. Taking on a project like this was a little difficult, but it's not beyond the skills of most people, as long as you've got a few tools and aren't afraid to make mistakes. Well, I hope this video has been informational. I tried to give you as much technical information as I can, dimensions, measurements, how to. If you'd like to build one yourself, don't be afraid to try it. Just always check your state and local laws to make sure that you're not breaking any laws. I spent a lot of time researching before I began this project. If you like this kind of content, please subscribe and click the bell for notifications. We're going to try to put out a lot more content soon. Thanks for visiting Red Barn Acres. Have a nice day.